Good morning, church. Welcome to The Crossing. We're so glad that you're here. Would you stand and worship with us? We're going to worship our God this morning, our God who meets us in every season, our God who is worthy of worship. So let's sing together and let's celebrate Him. Remember those walls that we called sin and shame. They were like prisons that we couldn't escape. But He came and He died and He rose. Those walls are rubble now. Yeah. Remember those giants we call death and grave. They were like mountains that stood in our way. But He came and He died and He rose. Those giants are dead. He does, he says. 
Good morning, family. God is good all the time. We come together because the Lord loves to see his family come together. And it's a very precious time for us to share together. You know, the early church, there were two ordinances that Jesus really pressed upon his disciples to follow. One of them you're familiar with is when we become disciples of Christ, we, we are baptized into the body and we become family. But another thing that he shares with us is the Lord's Supper, that time of communion when we express together that we are family and we look forward to the coming of Jesus. This morning, we're going to partake of communion. If you have not received one of these communion packets yet, just raise your hand and one of our folks will bring that to you uh, in the next moment. But it's good to see family here or even those who may not be with us who are online uh, joining us. But it's such a privilege to be called the children of God. Now, as I think about the Lord's Supper, and we, of course, know that Jesus asked us to remember Him. In that last uh, couple of verses we sang, talked about, turn your eyes on Jesus. You want to do that as we partake of the body and the blood of Jesus. You need to crowd out all the other things that want to filter into your hearts and minds right now. One of the things I always remember is I partake of the Lord's Supper, and I've shared this with you before, how we do this. We proclaim the Lord's death till He comes. And I'm looking forward to His coming. And in Revelation chapter 19, anybody love the book of Revelation? Let me tell you, it talks about His coming again and establishing His kingdom here with us. And it tells us in Revelation 19, it says, And I saw heaven standing open and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called faithful and true with justice he judges and wages war his eyes are like blazing fire and his head on it are many crowns he has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself he is dressed in a robe dipped in blood and his name is the Word of God. We come today to remember that the Word of God came and dwelt among us, and it was Jesus. So as you partake now of the, the bread and of the juice, remember Jesus. Not only was He here some 2,000 years ago, He's here now with us, but He's also coming back in a very wow incredible way and we'll see him coming as that victor to claim us his family for his own so right now we're going to ask that you bow your heads and after the prayer please partake of the bread and of the cup as you fell led let us pray together father god thank you for the moment that your family has come together in this place so that we might remember the name that is above all names, the name of Jesus. We thank you for Jesus. And Jesus, we thank you for giving your life, offering your body and your blood. Father, now as we partake of the bread and the juice that remind us of what Jesus did for us, may we think of nothing else but of Jesus, what he did for us, and that he is coming again. Keep us together, strong as a family, we pray in Christ our Lord. Amen.
I appreciate that Rachel talked about surrender. You know, we surrender to Christ when we are initially baptized into the family of God. We surrender our will every time we partake of the Lord's Supper. We're saying, Lord, we want we keep it focused on Jesus. And now we come to a time which uh, sometimes we don't want to surrender. But it's an important way to show that we care and we love Jesus who loved us. And that's the giving of what he has blessed us with. We always want to encourage you to give, to give like Jesus did, sacrificially for the building up of the kingdom of God. Don't you want to do that? I pray you do. Let us pray and consider how we may bless the world around us. And there's a lot of different ways to give, and we share those with you. But right now, let us pray and remember him again. Our Father God, how in Indeed, we remember that you have given so very much for us. Help us to learn to give even as Jesus has given. From the depths of our hearts, sacrificially and generously, so that the kingdom of God may be expanded and the family grow evermore. In the precious name of Jesus, amen. Good morning. I got lost in what he was praying and forgot to come up here and get my notes spread out. Thank you, Alan, for the great words this morning. You know, there's a lot of questions that Jesus asked in the New Testament, actually 300. We pick four questions out of that 300 that I would like to pose to you and ask you. And last week, you know, we asked a question this week we're going to talk about do you want to be well? That's a really big question because we live in a society that so many times makes excuses for not being well. But there's an answer to getting well, isn't there? How many of you know that answer? Tell me what that answer is. Okay, it's the number one word that everybody uses when you ask a question about the Bible. But a lot of this has to do with you, too. And as we look at this passage and as we look at this man and and see his situation, I want you to understand that God wants you to stop and answer this question for yourself. This verbiage was not just left for me, but it was left for all of us who are here today. And in the book of John, the Gospel of John, chapter 5, we run across a story, verses 1 through 4, and it says, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. He was a Jew, and he was keeping the Jewish law, and he's arriving to participate in this festival. Now, there was in Jerusalem, near the Sheep Gate, a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Now... When we go to Israel in November, um, we're going to see this actual place. It still sits there, and, and we'll talk a little bit about that story when we get there. It says, and here a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed, and waited for the moving waters. From the time to time, an angel of the Lord would come down and stir up the waters, The first into the pool after such disturbance would be cured of whatever disease they had. It's fascinating, isn't it? Scripture says, John says, that there was an angel who came down and stirred the waters. And the first into the water after being disturbed was healed. If you didn't get in the water, then apparently you're not healed. Do you know that there are multiple places in the world, gluten, Guadalupe, there we go, in Mexico City, Lourdes, France. In uh, Mexico, if you go to that site, they still believe that it has healing power. And there are thousands upon thousands of crutches stacked there, of people who have received healing and have left their crutches there. Now, a lot of people can't answer those questions. How does this happen and, and where does it happen? Well, we found something out. I, did, I had no idea about this. It's called Dunlap Mineral Springs Hotel. And guess where it was located? Kernersville, North Carolina on East Mountain Street. 
It was a popular vacation spot in the 1920s, but fell victim to the stock market crash in 1929. And uh, the bridge, and it was Dudley Cosmetics, was built on top of this spring. So it still exists, and hundreds and hundreds of people would come to receive healing from this spring that was fed into a pool. You didn't know that Kernersville had healing powers. Well, we do. There are healing powers in our midst, and God is still doing a mighty work. In John 5, 5, it says, the one who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. That's a long time. From the very beginning of his life, he could not walk. He was crippled. And he just couldn't get it done. Just couldn't get into the pool when the pool was ready. Before we ask the question Jesus asked, I want you to think about a great number of disabled people. Is said in this passage. There are a lot of disabled people And we're going to talk about some of the different groups of disabled people. And there's actually a new group that I'm going to identify for you that you may not have heard, but it is a real group that we're going to talk about this morning. In history, if you go back, the lifespan of a Roman in the Roman Empire was 40 years old. You were done by the time you were 40. This guy has perhaps been suffering and symptomatically weak and infirmed and hopeless for 39 years. Got about another year on their time scale and life scale. Jesus asked a foolish question. Or did he? You see, he was giving this man some self-awareness and some honest looks at himself. And the crowd of perhaps of hundreds of victims. But we ask that question today and everybody wants to say, right. The question that he asks, he asks in verse 6. And Jesus saw him lying there. And he knew that he had been in a condition for a long time. And he asked him, do you want to be healed? I want you to think about this for a minute. Do you want to be healed? There is a a new diagnosis. It's called trans-abled. B-I-I-D. Body Integrity Identity Disorder. And there are a lot of people who suffer from this disorder. You see, there are people here in our audience who have themselves a mental block, a mental illness, but they use wheelchairs unnecessarily. Some of these people who are diagnosed with this disease also even ask physicians to amputate their healthy body parts and cut into their spinal cord. This is a real issue that people face. Transable folks, we're not making fun of them. I know that this is a real illness that they have, but it's taking other people in a different direction. And you have to ask yourself, do I want to be healed? Now, the guy answers, but he doesn't answer the question. Do you really want to be healed? Listen to what he says in the next verse. He avoids the question that Jesus asked. Sir... The invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the waters are stirred. While I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Basically, he tells Jesus he's got nobody to help him. But he doesn't answer the question. You see, so many times we make excuses for the things that we suffer under. You know, my wife's got shingles and they're really bad. They're all over her front, all over her side, all over her back. And she just can't get anywhere where she can get true peace. And uh, they gave her some powders and things, and I hope that works because she's got to go to a wedding this coming Saturday that she won't miss. And uh, hopefully we get some healing. I'm praying that over her, and you keep praying. 
But I meet a lot of people who say, I want to be healed. Let me give you some examples. I don't want to be an alcoholic anymore. I don't want to use drugs anymore. I don't want to have anxiety anymore. I don't want to have depression anymore. But do you realize that some of that has to apply not just to Jesus, but to who? To you. You see, if you want to be healed, you have to accept responsibility for it. I had a total hip replacement. I came back to work after four days because I knew I wasn't going to sit on my backside. And then I was going to do the therapy and I was going to do it exactly as they said to do it. And I was going to recover from that. And I was going to get back into the fight. Amen. That's what you do. You listen to what they tell you. You add prayer to it and healing comes. Look at Alan. He was in a sling a few weeks ago, maybe a month ago. Now I can't keep track of time, but he's not anymore. Why? Because he followed what they asked him to do. How many of you have received healing when people have prayed over you and anointed you and, and shared into your life? Look at all the hands in here. Raise them high. Don't be embarrassed. I want the other people to see that this actually works. They think that it's just a mental thing and it's in your head. But when you submit to Jesus and you do what he's asked you to do, healing comes. Amen? Amen. And we've got to decide that we want to be healed of our infirmities. But that means I have to apply myself, I have to do something to get out of that behavior pattern and do what God has asked me to do. This guy, this guy is truly crippled, he has no way, he makes an excuse on why he can't get there, and then this is what Jesus does. Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat, and walk. Wow. Wow. Listen to the rest. And at once the man was cured and he picked up his mat and he walked. Do you realize that there is nothing impossible for God? What'd you say? There is nothing impossible for him. He says, get up. The guy's either going to do it or he's not. This is a command from the Lord Jesus Christ, and you either get up or you lay there where you've been for 39 years. And the guy pops up. He just gets up. No more excuses. Jesus poses the question, get up, or the answer, and the guy just pops up. Now, Jesus doesn't always heal in just this way, where he just reaches out and says, get up. I wish he would. I wish that some of us had power to go to a place and just touch children and raise them up. Just bring them out of bed. But I have seen it happen. I have seen lives changed and, and people healed. And, and maybe it's not on the same day. Maybe it's within that week. And I've seen people who have received this type of healing and they've been restored and God has done miraculous things. And like the Bible says, the dog returns to his vomit. They go right back to where they came from and show no appreciation to what Jesus has done. Amen? We've all seen it. We've watched people in their illnesses and their addictions and they come out and they're freed and God has done a great work in them. And that's why Jesus in the next verse says, pick up your mat. You're not going back to where you were. You got a new beginning. You got a new life. Use it for the kingdom of God. Witness about it. Because he's going to get in trouble for what he's done. <laughs> You see, Jesus healed him on the Sabbath. And he's picking up his mat and he's walking. And that's not something you were supposed to do in that culture. But I think God's got power over the traditions of the people. So many times we're hung in those traditions and, and we just can't move because, wow, if I step out of this box, I'm going to be in trouble. I'm in trouble all the time. Because I've stepped out of the box. 
I don't follow some of the norms. I don't avoid scripture. But in my methodology, I step out of the box. My board, with the exception of a few people at my new position I'm going to have in September, are really nervous about me. (laughs) As they should be. Because we're stepping out of the box. We did the same thing for 39 years. And it's time to change the venue. And I was open to God. I said, what do you want me to do? I'm not going to keep status quo, but what do you want me to do? And he told me. Not verbally, but through my heart. And all that fell into place. I was going to have this big bus built. And there was a trailer already built. It's in Winston-Salem. A friend of mine calls me and says, we're not going to buy. Can you use it? So we go look at it, and that's our first step. We step out, and we buy this trailer. It's being brought to Kernersville sometime tomorrow and being parked in a secure lot because then i got to raise another $100,000 to update it and get it to where we need it to be. But if you believe God's in it, then you've got to move on it, and if you don't believe God's in it, then don't do anything about it. There are people within our church who have cancer and they have it severely. And one of my brothers, David's going down to Jacksonville and uh, they've given him the okay to do this surgery and, and they're going to move forward with this disease at the Mayo Clinic of all places. It's pretty high caliber, but they don't take anybody else's word for what's going on in a person's body. They do all of that over and do all the examinations and then make a judgment whether they're going to do something because they're this high standard. And I believe David's going to be healed. I really do. I think that God's in what's taking place and sometimes he uses doctors, but you've got to know that he is the great healer. You see, what this man did when he picked up that mat, he removed the possibility of a relapse. This just isn't about your mind. It's about your heart. And I don't want you to go back from where you fought so hard to get away from. When God gives you healing, use it. For the kingdom of God. And then Jesus said walk. You realize something? Jesus wasn't going to carry him. He said you have the power to do this. So walk. This guy's been crippled for 39 years. It'd take a ton of therapy for all of us to get through that and start walking, wouldn't it? But when you're healed by the power of God, that surge of power, it is all natural. You know, he created Adam in one day. You all remember that? It was a pile of dust and he put him together and he raised him up as a man and he didn't have to learn how to be a man. He was a man because God had created him and instilled that in him. God wants to do something mighty inside of you today. He wants to bring healing to your life. And many of you may be very sick who are here today. You may have the the diagnosis that you have cancer. You know, I look at some of you and you've had multiple surgeries and you're still here. You're still ticking. And whether you come in on a wheelchair, whether you come in on one of these riders, or whether you come in with a walker, you are precious to the eyes of Jesus. He is excited that you're here and he's ready to do things in your life. And you wouldn't be here today if God hadn't acted in your life. Amen? Amen. We've just got to believe it. You know, I've told you about Maddie before. I'm doing her wedding this Saturday. And I'm so excited about doing this because it's been a long journey with Maddie. She's gone through a lot of different things, even though God healed her and raised her from being dead, basically, to life. Then she had some heart issues and had to have some different surgeries, and and yet she kept on moving and going. Now she's found this wonderful young guy, and and I've counseled them. They're great kids, and they're ready to get part of it. Now, I can't say I won't cry a little bit, 
probably not during the service, but maybe before, me and Matt will be in back just crying. But what a glorious opportunity we have to see somebody who was near death, healed, and now ready to engage in a marriage. Somebody who loves you and you love them. There comes a time that you have to let go of your anxiety. Cast all your cares upon him because he careth for you. That's what the Bible says. You see, casting means to throw off. Throw away. And there comes a point where you just got to cast off your anxiety. Jesus can handle it. You can't. That's why you're under the pressure. And that's why some of the things are happening in your body right now. You know, I'm going to be in medical ministry, and I'm excited about this. I've been chair of that board, and, and I've seen a lot of sick people over the last 37 years with really bad diseases like leprosy. If you've never seen that disease, it will freak you out when you first see it. Tissue, fingers, all kinds of things falling off of people's bodies. But there's healing for many of them today. I've seen what war can do to people. One of our doctors has removed limbs of patients who have been in those battles. And they're not warriors. These aren't soldiers. These are children and women who've lost legs and arms. And yet they keep going and they praise God that they've had this healing and that they're still here and they can still do the things that they need to do. I want you to know that you're not disabled today. You can be whole in Jesus. You may be walking on a walker. You may be in a wheelchair, but God's got you. And he will watch over you and he'll give you power to overcome. You ever watch basketball with people in wheelchairs? You ever watch some of these athletes who are disabled ski down a mountain at 70 mile an hour? You see, they've overcome those limitations and they know that God has more for them than where you're sitting. And it's time we, the church, believe that and we accept it and we encourage other people to move past some of these things that have held them down and have really controlled their life. It's time to throw drug addictions out the window. They don't have you. God's got you. You just got to speak it and get rid of it. Don't go back to it. Every alcoholic knows that you don't ever lose the desire for alcohol. You just overcome it. And the way that you overcome it is through the power and the name of Jesus. It will not hold you. If you call on him, he will release you. Amen? And some of you are sitting out there and you've experienced this. You know this for your own life. And I pray that you would be empowered today, that God would transform you. Jesus will lead you, but he doesn't have to carry you. You can walk and you can be who God has called you to be. You see, the first thing this guy had to do was transfer his faith of impossibilities onto Jesus who does the impossible. I believe that God still does the impossibles. And he wants to do it in your life today. And I don't know who I'm speaking to. Maybe I'm speaking to the whole church. And sometimes things get so bad in our culture that we just want to throw up our arms and say, what's the use? Because God can change everything in a millisecond. Did you hear what Alan read this morning? That the rider on the white horse is coming. And he's coming for his bride, the church. That's you. That guy, secondly, a lesson that I want to teach you. 
It's Jesus said, burn the bridge that has held you so long and don't go back to it. I can't tell you how many alcoholic homes I've gone into and I poured all their alcohol down the sink. Went through the cabinets. Because I'd say to that alcoholic, we're not going back to this. You're not going to do this. You're destroying your family. You're destroying your life. And we're done with this. I've been to crack houses. And I pulled people out of there. And you talk about something that freaks people out is when the preacher shows up. doesn't make it quite as enjoyable but you know some of those peoples are moms some of them are dads some of them are teenagers who need redemption and that's our job and sometimes we win sometimes we lose sometimes they go right back like the bible says a dog goes back to his vomit but you do your part And don't expect someone else to carry you. You do it. Under the power of Christ, you do it. You walk away from it. Where is my healing? My healing is in who? In Jesus. Say it. Some of you are afraid to say it because you think, okay, I got to throw away that crutch. I can't think that way anymore. I can't walk that way. I can go beyond what I thought I could do because Christ has now empowered me to do it. And that's scary. You know, I thought before I took this other job, I just go fishing. I went out yesterday and I just walked to a pond that I knew. It's private and it's all grown up except for one little section about this wide. And and I threw out my worm and I use artificial worms and I was just working it. And I wasn't paying attention. I was thinking about a lot of other stuff. And that fish hit that thing, about ripped that rod out of my hand. And... uh, I caught a five-pound bass. And the reason I know he's five pounds is because I carry a scale in my bag just to prove to Todd back there that it was real. Okay. Just saying. And that was all I needed. I just packed up my stuff, threw it in the car. Well, I did cast a few more times, but I didn't get anything. And I said, that's my piece today. It's just a time with God and I just had to get away and and think about some stuff. All these transitions, Kathy's sickness, there's just a lot of stuff going on. and, And yet God is working and God is healing. I want you to know something about Jesus. His primary reason for doing ministry was not about healing. That was not his primary purpose. He does it, okay? And entire cities, in Mark 1, the entire town came looking for healing. And Jesus said, we're going to go somewhere else where I can preach the gospel. Because that's the primary message. You can heal somebody physically, and, and we will, and we'll continue to do that. But the most important thing is that we sit down with that person and we pray and we reveal the gospel of Jesus Christ to them. Any doctor can doctor, but our doctor's going to pray. Our doctor's going to bring true healing to them that will last an eternity. That's the purpose of my mission. It's not just to have hospitals and doctors, but it's to share the gospel of Jesus In October, I've been invited to East Palestine. They've been in the news a lot. It's where that horrific uh, wreck was with the train, spilled all those chemicals. And uh, that was the area I grew up in. We actually played them in football. And Ken called me and he said, Pete, would you please come up here and just 
encourage. My prayer is that that medical vehicle is ready in October. If it is, we're going to pull it to East Palestine, Ohio, and we're going to set up a clinic. Because those people have sores on them and the government says, no, no problem, you can drink the water, everything's good. Baloney. They're having breathing issues. You know when they blew all that stuff up? They did it in Pennsylvania, way out in the field, up in the hills. And, and that cloud went 30,000 feet in the air. What do you think happened to all that? People need healing in East Palestine, Ohio. But more than a physical healing, they need Jesus Christ. And they're ready. So we're going to have a little mini revival while I'm there. And we're going to share with the people of that community. I am when I was a kid the biggest fight I ever got in was in East Palestine Ohio didn't paint them and uh, we were in the tri-county uh, championship and one of the guys picked up some of that and threw it in the center's face well he couldn't see of course they came over um, and I, I'm playing defense, not offense. And I saw it. So my mission was to clock that kid. And I did. And uh, I caught him right near the quarterback. And I could have hit the quarterback, but I chose to hit him. And uh, about ripped off his uh, shoulder pads. And he was just up shaking. And then all of a sudden we were in a fight. And they're all taking off their helmets. I'm not taking off my helmet. You punch through this thing. But I ain't taking mine off. And uh, we got in some trouble for that. And uh, the people of East Palestine remember who I was. Not who I am. That was B.C. before Jesus. Before Christ. And some of you may need a new start in life. You know, Joni Erickson Stata, um, who has been a quadriplegic and a great writer all of her life, and I quote her in this, the same Lord who healed the blind eyes and withered hands also said, gouge out your eye, cut off your hand, if it leads you to sin. The soul is a bigger deal and even your health. So here are a couple of applications. Notice our God never said yes to Jesus. Instead, he just explained the problem. And I know that Jesus heard him, but Jesus didn't acknowledge it. He just said, get up. And if the church is going to be the church, and we're going to help people move through whatever binds them right now. Whether it is depression, whether it is anxiety, whether it is grief, all of these things can keep us from being who God wants us to be. And they're natural. You know, our body sometimes reacts in different ways, but we don't have to stay in that condition. We can move through grief, right, Mamacita? It's my little friend in the middle right there. You can move through your grief. It just takes some time. But you can be what God has called you. You can move and throw off your anxiety. You can work through your depression. If you need medicine, then you take medicine. Sometimes that's a chemical issue and we can't fix it by counseling you. You have to have some medicine. If you're dealing with some other issues, then take the medicine. Mental illness, we're so ashamed of it so many times. And when we have it, we don't want anybody to know. and We don't want anybody to pray about it. It's just like any other illness. If you have kidney disease, you ask people to pray for you. If you're going through something emotional or mental, then reach out to somebody that you trust and tell them what you're going through and let them begin to pray for you. I've been around that stuff all my life and, and been praying for people and I understand that it's real, but you can also throw it off at some time and say, you know what? This isn't going to keep me from being who I am. I'll get level and I'll continue to do the work that God has called me. 
David prayed this prayer in Psalms 51, and I want you to pray it today in verse 10. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit in me. Renew me, Lord, change me. Take me where you want me to be. You see, the world says that we're lunatics, religious fringe. We don't really know that people are healed. Some of you are sick and the cure, sometimes people say, is just in your head. But I believe that healing truly happens and it can happen for you. Listen to what Jesus said in Luke 5, 31. It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. Psalms 147, 3 says, he heals the brokenhearted and he binds up your wounds. Any brokenhearted in here today? Any of you suffering from something that's not visible, but it's real? Any of you sick, physically sick, and you need some healing today? I want you to come to the altar today and kneel down. If you can't kneel, just stand there. And I want you to hand off whatever burden is laying on you. How many of you believe God can handle every burden in this room? Maybe it's time to name it, claim it, and lay it. And move past it. My heart bleeds for a lot of you because we've been on long journeys together and we've seen what Satan can do. The illness didn't come from God, it came from him. We're sick because sin is in the world. And maybe that's the first remedy to what's going on in your life is that you ask for forgiveness for your sin so that you can get right with God. Give me a clean heart, oh God. Create in me that clean heart because only he can do it. You need a heart transplant today? He's ready to do it. He's going to remove that stone cold heart and give you a fresh pump and ready to go heart for Jesus. And you're going to be able to do some things that you have never done. That little girl got in the baptistry this morning and Eddie was baptizing her and that water was cold. She was going, put me under <laughs> She just wanted to get out. But something miraculous happened to her life today. She found Jesus. And there's no replacement for him. So I'm calling you today to come. Our band's going to lead us in an invitation to him. And you just come and, and pray. If you're accepting Christ for the first time in your life, please come and see me or come and see Eddie. And uh, let us know your desire. If you've never accepted Christ as Lord and Savior, if you've never been buried with him in Christian baptism, today's your day. Hopefully we got the heater on. Maybe not. I want to tell you something. I baptized some people and they're in here. Would you all stand? I baptized them in the ocean on January the 1st. You want to, yeah. You want to talk about cold? And I'm thinking, do we really want to do this? And not only did they do it, but others did it. Because of their example, their love for Jesus. Thank you all for what you did and how you touched the lives of others. It's not impossible. The Bible says all things are possible with him. I believe that with all my heart.
and I believe it for you. So I invite you to come this morning. Give your heart, give your life. Come and kneel before the throne. You can come right here to the altar. Would you lead us?